What's up, guys? Welcome to the 130th episode of The Get Down, brought to you by Digital Music Pool. My name is Cream. And my name is Perari. We have... Oh, there it is. <laughs> there it is. I gotta add the sound effects. I'm here. You know what I'm I saying? I know. <laughs> it, it's safe for only when you're here. <laughs> so Perari's, Perari's taken over today for, for Gary. Gary is actually, uh, unfortunately, at a, a funeral today, but... I just want to, for anybody that's local, Jersey, New York City, I want to give a shout out to Fiori's Italian Deli. His uncle John is the owner of Fiori's, which is legendary in this part of the world. If you want to look it up, it's won all kinds of awards, best sandwich in the country, all this stuff. If you've ever been to this area or you ever come here, you got to make a pilgrimage to Fiori's legendary mozzarella, legendary sandwiches. Oh, yeah. Uh, if you haven't had a roast piece, Roast beef, mozzarella, and gravy on a roll in your life. This is the time to try it. Best mutts in Hoboken. No shade to anybody else, but Fiori's is just, I'm, I'm an old school guy. I'm an OG, and they're the OGs in town. You know, so. you get a couple Italians on the pod. We got to start with a little, some deli meat and some mozzarella. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let's a lot go. Of, Where's lot Gary? Finger emojis. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. So I, I want to start this week. I know, you know, the last couple episodes, I've been talking about my traveling and the different places I've played, but we're going to start it again today because. The, the show I played this Saturday I thought was one of my biggest shows I've ever played. I played Forward in Cleveland, uh, and I was sandwiched on this Labor Day weekend between Oliver Heldens and two friends, and wow. I played Saturday night. So it was, uh, it was really incredible, man. It was, it was you know, 1,200 people in front of me, like a true – I felt like a true artist set. It was, it was dope. Yeah, and I, you know, I haven't. Uh, obviously, I wasn't there to see you uh, this set, but you know, I was there for the Charleston set at Trio. Um, we just so happened to be in the same town at the same time. And man, like the transition from you going from like these open format rooms that like we were doing from you know maybe like five years ago, six years ago, to now when you're playing these like really awesome like bass house sets, bass house driven sets, and you get to play what you want. Man, I had so much fun with you the other night. It was awesome to just kind of see you do your thing there. Uh, I don't I don't get the pleasure of doing that a lot now because I'm so busy, but I love when I'm able to go out and get inspired from like you or anyone else. And it's so cool how you're, you know, just kind of putting the cream brand out in all these markets. And it's about damn time. It really is. No, it feels good, and I, it is overdue, you know? I think uh, I, I had a conversation with someone. I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm, the rest of this year, I'm really going all in on the cream brand and, and taking a step away on some other stuff so I could really focus on getting to where I need to go and where I want to go. And, you know, I've kind of put that off a little bit with the get-down stuff and, and obviously with COVID. So, you know, these last few weekends and this, la this whole summer, honestly, has really just motivated me to, number one, show me that I can play any room in the country and carry any room. And that I really want to pursue this more, you know? And it, it's been nice. You brought up, like, the bass house sound. And it's, it's the production stuff that I'm doing with you. And then it's translating in my sets because I get to play the style of music that I'm also making, which is pretty cool so right but it's 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 overall i mean this is this isn't an overnight thing i think you and gary may have talked about this like on the last podcast but this wasn't a product of oh like i'm just going to turn on this switch and it's going to happen for me no this has been a product of everything that you guys have done for get down and all the other guys in the last three four five six years it's been just a long time coming and it's finally just starting to catch that flame and now that flame has to keep burning right so i think it's a combination of things it's not just like your music production but it's your branding like the, I, I remember this like the specifically and i use this a lot as an example for a lot of people i talk to but i always bring up your instagram with like the red and the black theme at one point like that was super on point then i bring up like the podcast and the topics and the reels and this and that and it's and it's a product of everything it's making that the make people aware of what the cream brand is and, and kind of what you represent and it's like this artist coach this this open format dj who's transitioning to this artist and now you're this artist this bass house artist and i think all of that combines into one thing which is now you're you're getting the results from yeah it's awesome man it's it feels good and, and once you see some success you just get that motivation to keep keep going and i think that goes for anybody and anything that they're pursuing but so i a topic that i did want to bring up and it's because of all my travel and it's because many times when i am talking to some of the younger djs and artists that we work with their goal and one of their goals always is I want to be a travel DJ. Yeah. And it took me, it's taken me a really long time and I'm still trying to transition into that, that role of travel DJ and artist. And it's not something that just happens overnight for a few people. It can happen overnight. There's a certain lanes that you can really go into to, to, to get that faster success. 
one lane, which I took, was a slow burn lane. It was building relationships. It was, you know, playing all the big spots in my own market and really becoming one of the top DJs here in this tri-state area first and then making those networking connections and slowly growing. But, like, they all want to grow and, and go into these other markets, but I think it's important that you have to become one of the biggest people in your market. And we've talked about this before, but I really want to hammer this point home because every single person I talk to is like, I want to travel. I want to go play this place and this place and this place. But yeah. it's not that easy. It's not. It's actually really, really, really hard. And it gets even harder when you're on the road and you're, you know, taking like, – for me, I played in Alabama two weeks ago, and I had to fly from Newark to Atlanta. Uh, Atlanta, take a – rent a car and drive an hour and a half down to um, – uh, where was it? Uh, Auburn, Alabama. And that's going to a different time zone. Now, this is one of the only places that I play as a traveling DJ where the airport is in a different time zone. So going there is easy because you gain an hour. But then I play till 2 a.m. You know, you have a couple drinks, you're a little drunk, you sleep, and you got to make that trip back. But that hour now becomes two hours because you have to go forward an hour. And getting back is such a nightmare sometimes, and it's very, very hard. So everybody talks the talk, but nobody wants to do the walk. I think, in my opinion, but like you kind of mentioned, there's, I, I never felt like there was always one way. Like when I was coming up, you know, I grew up with guys like 4B, uh, Mac J, um, a, a bunch of big successful artists right now. And I always saw them and kind of how they rose to success. And for me, my mindset was always, I got to do what they got to do. I got to be doing this and I got to be doing this when really everybody's paths are different. And it's all a culmination of all the things you talked about, like relationships and this and that. I just think with the younger guys, it's it's a different era, and correct me if I'm wrong, but, like, I don't get when, like, I'm at, like, a, at a family event or something, and somebody younger is controlling the iPod, and you ever have that one person where they're controlling the aux cord, they'll play 15 seconds of a song, and then they'll switch it, and they'll play 15 seconds of another song, and they'll switch it. It's because this this generation is so used to having things on demand. You want to listen to a song, you could literally type it on your phone and listen to it. So I think it comes with everything and that bleeds into the success, I think too. Is like, well, I just did this and now I want to play travel gig, so I want it. Here I go. When right. really these things still take time, like you said. And it's all about those relationships, those little baby steps along the way that get you to take that one giant step. And I think um it's all about patience. It's like patience, young grasshopper, right? It's going to happen for you. But, you know, you look at somebody like yourself who's been doing it for over 10 years, well, like myself who's been do doing it over 10 years. And then some of the younger guys, they have a lot of success thanks to Get Down and all these other things, Parari Production Academy, Shameless Plug, and all these other things that are helping them gain success fast. But at the same time, it's like you have to wait and pay your dues and take your turn. And that's not going to happen in one year, maybe two years it, it might happen, maybe three. Or it could be the case of us where it happens eight or nine years down the line. You know, you just never know. But just keep doing what you're doing and doing it right and doing it well will always take you forward, at least in my opinion. Yeah, I love that advice. And don't worry about what other people are doing. Don't worry if one of your peers moves faster than you. Just because they did something that made them move faster doesn't mean that you can't get to the same place. It might take you a little longer or you might take, you know, a couple different turns to get to the same place. But don't worry if someone else is getting to where you want to go, you know? Like, maybe look at what their process was or how they got there and take some things and learn from that person to help you get to where you want to go. And, you know, the patience thing, it, it's easy to say, but it's hard to, to do sometimes, right? Like Definitely. It, well, it, going back onto your last point, too, like, if anyone wants to watch a really inspiring music documentary um, just about, like, people in the music industry that made it and, and you want to talk about patience right and being in the right place at the right time really go watch the defiant ones by um it's on hbo i think or, or max whatever it's called it's uh the documentary about jimmy iovine and dr dre right yeah, and jimmy awesome. iovine says one of my favorite quotes ever and every time i'm feeling you know like i'm looking to the left and the right of me and i see this guy getting bigger this guy doing this and i'm stuck i always remember this quote and he says uh you know why ho race horses um, have blinders on their eyes, right? It's so they can look in one direction. Because if they look to the left or the right, they trip up and slip. And it shows a clip of a horse looking to the left. He trips, and all the other horses trip <laughs> behind him. And that one guy who just kept his head down keep, keeps moving, moving forward. And I think that's the biggest thing um, that I always take away when it comes to this stuff is, you know, don't worry about the left or the right guy. Just keep your head down and keep moving forward. Um, and I, I just think it's a really inspiring documentary about, you know, 
uh, like patience and, and how patient Dr. Dre was until he had his moment. And Jimmy, too. I mean, he literally had to be in the right place at the right time for the Beatles to say, hey, the engineer's not coming in the studio. Can you come record us? And he did it, and that's how he got his success. So uh, it, it's, it's really inspiring. I think you guys should, should go check that out if, if, if you really need some motivation and stuff. Yeah, great documentary. There, there's some other good ones on there, too. The Swedish House Mafia one's good. The Avicii great. one's really good. The AM one's really good. So there's lots of uh, – yeah motivational documentaries you guys could go check out but <laughs> like thinking about the, the current artists right like mal p's been doing this a while and he's <laughs> he's been patient and producing and doing all kinds of stuff who and, and who now in the discord was saying like <laughs> someone in the discord goes uh i didn't know mal p was maurice west and i was like like facepalm right it had to have been hova or, or timo or somebody i feel like because i feel like it was probably hova because he was the one hating on the hardwell set when he came back so <laughs> sorry hova i'm picking out on you but i mean you look at maurice west's career right he was doing this for so so long as maurice west has yep. an official remix with hardwell you guys all probably played every time we touch right he has some insane insane records but it took him to take a step back to try something new maybe it was a covid pivot thing i'm not really sure maybe just experimenting with new sounds and he's been doing this for so long he was already an experienced experienced producer could have made whatever he wanted but the fact that he changed kind of switched up his whole thing and everything was so inspiring to me and i'm loving what he's doing absolutely loving it yeah i mean he's one of the biggest artists out right now i think the other thing that you could take from mal p guys is it's okay to rebrand you know just because you've been dj whoever for for 10 years or five years or even one year doesn't mean that you can't rebrand into something else you know definitely and, and sometimes i think guys i think it is important to rebrand to kind of shed especially if you're trying to do something different if you're a hip hop DJ and you want to be a house music producer, maybe that's a good time to, to think about a rebrand or a, ne a new name or a new logo or something. Definitely. I, I went through it myself. I mean, I, I was used to go by Mikey P. If anybody knows me from those days, we kind of talked about it in another podcast, but I had a whole career under Mikey P. Very, very successful. Like, um, you know, it was blowing up with the music production. I had every DJ in the world playing my stuff. And I remember playing Life in Color. Um, and I crushed it like played all new my new music like I was, I was right before bingo players or david solano i think and the owners were actually there the the guys that own life, life in color so shout out to patrick and uh, luke um they were there and they said hey man you are a really really good dj you have some amazing music and but they said to me you know your name sucks and the <laughs> music that you're making this big room like you know melbourne bounce style like Mikey P sounds like I think that you're like Paul E.D. and I think you're gonna come up with Spike Tear and all this stuff <laughs> and they said you know maybe it's time to change your name and, and switch it up and I remember doing this whole photo shoot doing this whole rebrand a new logo and everything and I became Parari in 2016 and it's funny because like there's still some people that know me as Parari but then there's still some people that know me as both the Mikey P and the Parari and they think like I just was this Parari guy that just you know shot out into the New Jersey scene out of nowhere but I had this whole career behind me already before that with all the experience and I went into Parari knowing what I was going to do and for me that was the biggest I think game changer for me um where I switched my name and my name actually fit the music it was like six letters now it was European it had like the uh the swag to it a little bit um which is just my last name guys minus one uh one letter I dropped one letter from it but um but yeah and I think that worked out just like it would work out for, you know, the Mal P or anybody else. And yeah. there's been plenty of other big EDM DJs that have done that, that a lot of guys don't realize they had huge careers before that. It's interesting. I, it's always funny to be like, oh, my God, I didn't know that this person used to be this person or yeah. is that person, you know? <laughs> it's funny. Uh, it's funny because, like, I'm so into the scene. I love this. I love dance music. I love it, like, everything about it that I know who's done everything, you know? And I know what that, like, I, I, I guess a student asked me this once. They're like, we were in Miami, and they were like, well, how do you know that's, you know, the A&R of Spinning, or that's the, the – I'm like, because I love it. I, I, I know who these people are, you know, and it was right, the same you case homework. with, you know, yeah. I saw Mal P in the airport at 5 a.m., and I was afraid – not afraid to go up to him and say, hey, Maurice, because I even knew his name, you know. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, it's so important to know these things, I think. But, um, yeah. So we started with, with kind of like my slow grind and my path together, but I think there's a couple other paths, right? So yeah. let's let's talk about the other two paths. The first one we've kind of touched on, right? Production. That's one way that you can, as a DJ who's playing your local market, 
get to the next level. How Easy. can a, how can a DJ do that? Talk Easy. To me about it. It's 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 as simple as we're we're in a very weird like musician position, I guess, where we're DJs, but in order to perform our music, we have to DJ it, right? So, or, or I'm sorry, let me rephrase it this way. We're trying to be producers and we make our music basically on a computer or, you know, a piano in our studio, but the way we perform our music most times, 95% of the time, is by DJing it, right? So, your number one product as a DJ, regardless of anything, if you want to get booked, is going to be your music, right? If you have people that want to come out to hear the songs that you make, that is your product, right? Now, using that music, there are so many other things that you can do with that, right? You can use your music to market TikToks and blow up on TikTok that way. Maybe you do production tutorials. Maybe you do top five uh, of my favorite drops. A lot of the guys like Mao P are now doing these things where they're saying drop one, drop two, drop three, drop four, drop five, and they're playing five new IDs at shows and people are getting excited about it. I mean, I'm we've seen it. watching and consuming those videos. Yeah, love that, right? Like a as a DJ because you're seeing what records are trying to come out and they'll tease them, tease them, tease them up until the point where people are begging them for it and then they'll yeah. release it finally. I mean, we've seen that with who? Dom Dalla, uh, John Summit with the, you yeah, know, the sure. Where You Are all record. The, all the biggest artists artists because because they're playing these huge shows and all these people are watching that and and videoing there right the ids are going straight to tiktok like what is this we need this song right and there's there was a cool conversation we kind of had too uh i had it with the disco fries um kind of like over twitter is there was an interview another great interview by the way you should watch uh with dj spider shout out to him and james hype and you know james hype talks about like he was an open format DJ doing these runarounds like we were doing, right? Like doing all these clubs, making a ton of money, like killing it in his market. But he knew what he had to do for his career and what was maybe not the best move, but was the right move he talks about, right? He and was it's an open like format well, DJ too, right? Say it again. He was an open format DJ, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And was open for I mean, there's no way you can get that good at DJ without right. being an open format DJ, <laughs> right? So so, you know, he was playing these markets and he was doing his thing and yeah, he was making a ton of money like we just talked about. But the right thing to do was to take a step back, maybe make a little less money, but start making music because people will want to go see him because he can DJ and play his own music. And I think that's where the James Hype craze came around. Because now it's not like James Hype, let's say he plays a bad bunny record in his set, right? People will go absolutely nuts because they know him for house music. So he, if he throws a bad bunny acapella over his one's routines, people think he's the greatest thing in the world. But yeah. then you have the open format DJs that are sitting here, you know, well, I play bad bunny every night. Why am I not? You know, I can do this routine too. Well, it's because, you know, when someone goes to pay you or pays to go see you, maybe at, you know, Hoboken or, you know, wherever you are, right? They don't know if you're going to play a two-hour classic hip-hop set. They don't know if you're going to play house music. They don't know if you're going to play Bad Bunny. They don't know if you're going to play any of those things. So why are they paying to go see you? Because if they don't know what they're going to hear, they don't know what they're paying for. But with James Hype, you go to hear him play his house music, right? And that's the biggest thing. And producing music was the way that he got there and became this house guy. Even in your sets, right? If you're trying to become this guy and you're playing a club that's maybe open format— Stick to the house stuff. I would say just ride it, ride it, ride it, ride it. Even if no one likes you there, fuck it. You did what you had to do, and that was your brand, and you stuck to it, right? Yeah, granted, the open format DJ and us would be like, oh, maybe play a little hip-hop. And I do it all the time to make the club owners happy. <laughs> yeah. But that's how I can transition as a, you know, open format DJ just like you. Um, but, you know, having all of these skills is super, super important. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, in a lot of my sets, in the rooms that still are open format that I'm playing, I'm really trying to push the house music as much as possible. Where Definitely. Maybe I was doing, you know, 60% EDM and 40% everything else. I'm really trying to get to like 75 or 80% EDM. Right. And 20 or 25% everything else. But even if you do want to play Bad Bunny and you're doing all this house music, right? This is where you say, okay, hmm, light goes off. Let me make an edit or a right. remix with Bad Bunny so it pleases the club owners and I'm still pleasing the people in the crowd by playing Bad Bunny, but it's my own version of it, whether right. it's your own edit or your own remix or you go and download a remix from somebody else or a homie of yours that did the Bad Bunny remix. And that's where the music production really kicks in. It's and We talked about this before. It's what songs should I be playing or I need to be playing in the clubs right now that still fit my sets and should I make a remix of it? Should I make my own rendition of it? And I think that has been going like crazy. Uh, you know, like even like this Slut Me Out record. Yeah. 
I hate that song. I, I, it doesn't fit my sets, but I saw Castro. I saw he did the same like video. A, <laughs> same video, right? Yeah. He did this big room techno edit of it, and I was like, dude, send this to me. I need, <laughs> Yo, I I need this. the same thing. I hit him up. My Castro, send me that. Need that. So shout out to Castro. But that's another great way of incorporating a record that you don't like, and now I like that rendition of it. So, And it also fits into your style, and you, it fits your brand more. So, right. Not only you're making customers and fans happy, but you're also staying true to what you're doing. So definitely, I, I think that you know I came from the edit world, and I still to this day think that the edits are super important because every time I go DJ, I play 50% cream edits, and most other people don't have that. So it's an easy way to make my certain sets unique in playing stuff that maybe people know, but they don't have that version. And I think that makes a really big difference. Feedback from my set in Cleveland was. Cream played a lot of shit that I didn't know. And I'm like, yeah, because like, – or, like, a lot of stuff that I don't have. And it's like, yeah, because it was all my own edits that I was right. playing. Or, like, Solano unreleased shit or, like, whatever, you know, stuff to make my set unique yeah. in, that, in that way. I, I've been doing that for years. I mean, I, I started, uh, you know, I guess very young, uh, 2010, 2011. I was running the crack for DJs, Crook and Clan Circuit, making edits. Um, I, it was just because I was playing these clubs, Surf Club – um, KCO tools, all these teen clubs, Karma, and everybody was playing the same shit. And I was like, I want to play what I want to play, like this EDM stuff, but I'm going to play it with records or mash it up with records that people know. And one of the ones that, again, I still play this song every set, Smells Like Teen Spirit, Nirvana, play it every set, and I just re-edit that same edit I made for, you know, how many years ago that was? And I just keep re-editing it, recycling it, changing seven the drop. Seven Nation Army, I've done the same edit four, four, year, four times, I think. Right, Seven Nation Army, <laughs> I just drop, keep the same build. break I made, and I just change the drop to something new. But it's yeah. a good way to blend, like, again, that Nirvana stuff or, like, the Beastie Boy stuff that I loved always incorporated in my set. And those edits, nobody has. I mean, yeah. I keep those edits in the vault. You could hear them in my set. You could hear them in my radio shows. But other than that, you're only hearing them when you come see me, and I think that's pretty cool. Um, and it makes it it makes it interesting. It makes it fun that you know it's not the same guys playing the same shit every single week. Right. All right. So that's one lane, like producer lane. We talked about how you can use production to kind of start growing your brand, growing your customer base, and also getting booked out of state. If you're making music that people are going out of their way to find and play and post in their social media. People are going to come to book you. They're going to find you, whether it's originals, whether it's remixes, maybe even edits. If you're, you know, a pretty bigger, if you're a bigger open format or EDM DJ. The other thing I'll say is we're giving you guys this this advice as far as if you're an open format DJ and you're trying to like transition your name and your brand. Like if you're playing the small little bar in your city or town, like you might not be able to do that. <laughs> you know, like yeah, you have to work your way up to being able to to ha build a little bit of a name where. If you go left a little bit, the owner is not going to be like, what the fuck is this guy doing? Get him off the set. You know, yeah. like you can't really do it in your opening sets and your bar sets like this is for the nightclubs or when you started to build a name and you could start to play more your style, you know? Yeah, push the envelope a little bit, you know? You can't come out um, the gates and you you get booked for your first gig and you're like, I'm going to play every ID I got. And like, yeah, no, this is, it goes back to that book, right? That book that me, you, and Gary always talk about, that that rule book that never was written. Yeah. Like, it's this invisible book, but you got to pay your dues, man. Like, it, it took a long time for me to play really good rooms, really shitty rooms, everything in between to get where you are today. And now you can kind of, like, push the envelope and, you know, drop that you know, Eli Brown track maybe at Birch if you're, like, feeling it, you know? Yeah, but, like, if will. you're doing that, you're new. Owners may look at you with, like, eight heads, you know right. what I'm saying? So, like, cream, I don't know what this guy's playing. It's, like, some <laughs> techno shit. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, but if they know it's me, like, they know I'm into that 150 BPM side trance. Well, right. why are you booking me if you, if you – all you have to do is go on my SoundCloud or my Spotify page right. and look. That's the music I make, you know? Right, but you so, earn that leeway. You have yeah. those records. People can go look at you and listen to your music that you've made and understand – this is his style. Like, if Correct. you don't like it, don't book this person. Exactly. Today. I'd like to think that most people that book me do a little bit of research and say, okay, he does make this this style, this 150, but people like it. Look, I'm, yeah, this song has a million streams on it. This song has 300,000 streams on it. So, you know, it's it, it, it's a, you know, uh, uh, it's not so black and white as far as that, basically. Right. It's, it's, it's you, once you start having these things, people know you for that thing, you could go ahead and start doing it, especially if they like it. But it takes right. a while for you to find that thing. I mean, I've, I've made every genre in the world. I've made Bass House, Melbourne Bounce as Mikey P, Big Room, this, the 150 Side Trance. It took a while for me to find my sound. But now that I have that, 
I can now push that envelope uh, into the clubs for sure. All right, so we talked like the DJ slow burn. We talked music production as a way to get out of your market. The final one, and this is more, you know, this is newer. This is post-COVID, I'd say, where your social media and your TikToks and your Instagram and your branding there can get you booked and can get you to grow really, really, really quickly. And we've seen it, Angelo, right? Remember, we talked about Angelo in Miami, how someone came up to him and was like, oh, you're the TikTok DJ that does the, the lists. And he was like, after that, he was like, I don't want to be the TikTok DJ. I want to be like yeah. the, the dope artist. And he's, you know, built his way. But Angelo was someone close to us that used social media to grow really quickly, right? Right. And now he has this platform where he can now, you know, you kind of see his social media kind of changing a little bit. He's doing more of those, like we talked about, like those different drops. He's posting more of the stuff that he's doing at Trio, and he's kind of becoming like, now I have this platform. Well, let me use it now to show who I really am, this artist, which is great. But I think another guy that, you know, uh, you know, local guy that just like completely slayed it on TikTok was uh, Nick Spinelli. And he's yeah, doing Nick's it in the wedding format market. Now, imagine you're this wedding DJ who, you know, is maybe getting to two thousand dollars a wedding just to show up to the wedding whatever but then you got a guy like nick spinelli who's doing the tiktoks and people know of him and i'm sure he's not getting two thousand dollars for a wedding i'm sure that number is going way up right now for and sure. it's because he can because he's got the people to be like wow he's doing this wedding on tiktok look how crazy the people are i'll pay any amount of money to get this guy to dj my wedding right so you know TikTok is such an, and I'm the worst person because I always talk about this and preach it and I still am sitting here because I'm so busy with a ring light in the background of my studio trying to open it and start getting this going but I have this whole TikTok plan too that I would love to love to execute right where I want to you know change my social media into what people kind of think of me now like I I think that over the last maybe year or two years especially, uh, I, I don't feel like I'm more like the DJ's DJ anymore. I feel like I'm more like this producer coach and mentor, and I think my social media content has to reflect that. And that's kind of the transition I'm going to make over the next couple months with my TikTok is kind of – and even my Instagram is giving more production tips, doing more cool interviews like this, um, and, and trying to grow that way because I feel like those are the things that I'm interested in and those are the things that I want to attract. Maybe the younger guys are attracted to me because of the advice I give, and I have the results to prove it because I've done X, Y, and Z, or I've you know mentored this student, and he's done X, Y, and Z. So I think that – kind of realizing what you're good at, what's your niche, right? Like what what do people like you for? Is it your fashion, right? A lot of my uh, Instagrams was me wearing like some of my sneakers because I love sneakers and I have all these rare sneakers, right? Um, most people used to comment on my Instagrams and comment on my sneakers and didn't really even care about what the music post was, right? <laughs> so what's your thing? Think about what people like you for and, and, and kind of like what you think you want to present to the world and incorporate that into your brand. I mean, even today, I'm still incorporating things I love fashion, music, art, all of those things into my brand. And these are things that I'm genuinely passionate about. And hopefully people can understand my vision from that, you know? So I think TikTok is such an underrated thing that that a lot of guys, especially if they want to blow up, should really, really be uh, going all in on. Yeah, I think that is an, the easiest way to blow up quickly. And especially if you're newer and you're looking to create a name for yourself or create your brand or figure out what your brand is, Go all in on TikTok, and, and that could be your lane. If production's not your lane and you don't want to be an open format DJ, go all in on, on the TikTok thing because you can grow so quickly and people can become aware of you so quickly in whatever you're doing. And it's just an easy way to get booked out of market or out of a country or whatever you're trying to accomplish, it, it's just a platform that can help you so, 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 so I mean, much. how about some of the guys that we were talking about booking, right? Like we were talking about booking a guy who that had like, uh, th this, this DJ was $15,000, right? Now, granted, their TikTok was okay, whatever it was, but then we found somebody on TikTok who had multiple, multiple thousands of followers who was blowing up, right? And he was what, maybe a quarter of the price for that, right? Yeah. And, you know, people would want to pay to see that person more than I think the other person that we were talking about. And it's because of TikTok in that he had something that people would pay to go see. He could have been the worst DJ in the world. And that's a conversation that like always pops up in the discord, right? Well, why is this model getting booked or why is this? Well, it's very simple. Either their TikToks pop in like, uh, you know, take someone like Summer Rae or like, Summer you know, Rae is the best example. She's exactly. the best example because you know what? Summer Rae is going to sell out your club. 100%. Period. Period. 
You know, who, like, there are so many other artists that are so, such better DJs, such better producers, have been in the game so much longer, but you know what? They can't sell shit. Right. So why, as a club owner or a booker, a talent buyer, like I've been doing here recently, why would I book the guy that or the girl that can't sell a ticket over someone who can sell my club out? Like, right, exactly. And you don't have to do anything. You don't have to worry about anything she has to play or anything like that. You just know, like, that club is going to be sold out. Like, I just played with uh, James Kennedy from Vanderpump Rules, and that was right. in the Same mist. Thing. It was in the midst of the whole Vanderpump Rule drama. He and can actually I, DJ a little bit, though. He, he DJs, yeah. yeah, 100%. He DJs. He's he's a DJ in the show. He plays the uh, See You Next Tuesday party at the, the restaurant in the show, or whatever it is. Uh, shout out to all the Bravo husbands out there. That's the only reason why I know this. <laughs> I swear I don't watch Bravo unless I'm with my wife. <laughs> yeah, okay, but, all right. We know, uh, yeah, we know I, maybe I fan. like it a little bit. But <laughs> anyway, uh, James, it was awesome, man, and he is he earned every cent. I mean, granted, I don't even know if he was up there DJing. He was running around the place, singing the songs, taking his shirt off, doing everything. And when I told you that was the most sold-out club I've seen in a, in a while— it was slammed. You couldn't even move. Like, I was sweating so much just from being in the presence of all those people, you know? And, again, you could book a James Kennedy or you could book the guy that, you know, isn't going to draw one person into the club. So it's it's all about having that presence and, and, and having that brand. And I think TikTok is a, and, and branding is a skill, right? There are other skills that you could have besides that that will get you booked, right? I mean, we could talk about just music production in general. Music production is a skill. But that skill can lead you to be maybe an engineer, uh, a co-producer, a songwriter, you know, all of these other things that could uh, maybe even make you money or just grow your brand even more, you know? And and a lot of people don't think about these things as skills. They think of things as, oh, I have to do this because X, Y, and Z. Just grow your skill set, and you could help anybody. Like whether you make flyers for other DJs or monthly rundowns, if you're doing that, you're making relationships with other DJs, you know, and maybe you've been making a flyer for this club and then all of a sudden another bigger club loves that and wants you to do a flyer and you could maybe spin it into, hey, I'll do the flyers if you get me a booking, you know, yeah. and then you go take the opportunity and you kill it. So photographer, videographer, graphic design, like all of it, booking DJs, right? Like a talent bot, like all of these things, like you said, help you grow your network because you're meeting a lot of people and you never know. Which one of those people can help you in your career or whatever career you're looking to pursue, if it's DJing or producing or whatever it is? Yeah. You, that, that network is so, so valuable. And like you said, building those skills that you, you don't necessarily know where that skill can take you. But if you get good en enough at something, you're going to get paid to do it, you know, in one 100%. shape or form. What did DJ AM say? Uh, do something you love so much that you'll do it for free and then find someone to pay you for it. Yeah. Right? Like. That was my quote growing up when I wanted to become a DJ. It was like, I love to do this. Now, who's going to pay me to do what I want to do, right? Who's going to pay me to do what I love to do? And you, you, you're going to find someone that's going to do it as long as you're good at it. You right. can't be half-assed at it. You got to be good at it. And that's the end of the, you know, the, the end goal uh, for a lot of guys. Yeah, so, I mean, you, you brought up some of these things. Let's, let's get into some of the lanes. What are some of the lanes that us as DJs can get into? I, I, let's actually, you know what? What are some of the lanes that producers can go down besides just being the big artist? Everybody wants to be the artist, but in your journey of learning how to produce and making music, sometimes other opportunities come up. So kind of let people know wh what some of these lanes could be. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's tough to make it. And it's not just producers. It's just artists in the industry, right? Like, it's tough to, to make it. And I, and I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but I, I – not everybody is going to make it, right? And and not only that, like, unless you're Tiesto or, you know, David Guetta, like, do you really want to be, you know, not do really, of course I would want to, but can you really DJ up until you're 50, 60 years old, right? Can you? So, you know, there's a lot of other lanes that you can do with some of the skill sets, right? Like, you know, I'm this artist um, that I wanted to be this big DJ, this travel DJ, but now here I am sitting in my studio, you know, with 17 sessions this week doing all types of things like engineering. I'm doing more engineering now than I've ever done, and I think that was like a blessing because I know when I'm 60, 70 years old and artists who are never going to – music's never going to go away, right? Like I know artists will always need their song engineered um, and always need that human touch to it, and I'm able to do that. Co-production, 
Um, a lot of guys think of this as like, oh, it's ghost ghost production, right? But everybody gets help on music, and you should not be ashamed to have someone help you on your music in order to get it done, right? So co-production, having you know credits on other people's songs can not only just give you money or you you know just help you grow relationships with that artist. If you do a co-production for an artist like um, you know A Craze, let's say before he blew up, and then he blows up, and that song blows up and turns from that, you know. Think about all the people that you're going to meet there and how many people are going to want you to, to hire you because you worked on X, Y, and Z with this artist, right? Um, it also just songwriting. adds to your resume as a whole, right? Like, yeah. When, when you're going and trying too. to create these new relationships, you're like, well, here's here's my resume. Of, here's the, right. the other this is what I did. I like, on. I don't think a lot of people know this about me, but I produced a record for Paris Hilton when I was 20 years old, all right? And I had no idea what I was doing with music production back then. I was just in a college dorm just making beats, uh, got connected with a manager back then, and he presented a project to me that I, you know, just was like, hey, I'll try it. I did my thing. No, it wasn't a job by any means. It was just like a fun thing. And then I get a phone call saying, hey, yeah, uh, Paris Hilton is hopping on this, and it's coming out on Cash Money Records, <laughs> and, you know, it's it, congratulations. And I'm 19 years old in college thinking, like, what the hell am I doing in college? I just – did a song with Paris Hilton. I'm gonna be this rich and famous guy. You know what I'm saying? But that um and that didn't happen. By the way, I think I get a royalty check for a hundred dollars every quarter for Paris Hilton. But <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, at that time, the checks are still showing up. The ca the checks are still coming. I'm I'm uh, that's that's you know tw eleven years in the future, and I'm still getting those checks right. So you know, there's so many other opportunities that you can do with these skills, right? Like I it, I could have said, hey. This isn't my record, uh, you know, so I'm not going to work on this. I'm only producing Ferrari records. But no, I had the skills to co-produce this record with my homie uh, Mr. Beats from YMCMB, and I co-produced it, co-wrote it, and uh, it came out. And, and, you know, it was something cool, and that's a, something under my belt. And now I do it more for bigger EDM guys. Some guys, you know, don't want people to know, I would say, uh, that I'm working on music for them. Other guys don't really mind, and they give me credits, but it's all part of that portfolio and, and what you could kind of do with just music production. Now, think about all the other things that you could do, not DJing, but all the things that evolve around that. Like, you're a talent booker. You um, you book talent for Get Down and uh, some of the Hoboken venues, right? Then you also have, um, like, a podcast that revolves around DJing. But there's all these skills that you're picking up that are helping make cream be cream. Yeah. And also, not only that, when I am ready to move on to the next project or do something else, I have all of this stuff that I've done in, throughout my career that can help me land if I want to go get a job with a record label, with, you know, I don't with whoever, like with, with yeah, whatever music I'm, I'm programmer, trying to get into. right? Like you, you take a look at like uh, some of the guys from 92.3. Well, you know, 92.3 right, was one of my favorite. Working yeah, for the big One of my clubs, favorite radio talent. stations. Right. And – you know, those guys, like the radio station's gone. They're a little bit older now, but a lot of them have found careers as music programmers at another radio station or, um, you know, maybe like Music Choice, which is the one that's on the TVs, like, uh, like the, yeah, the higher up channel. Torah. They're programming all the music on that and making sure that they're connected with labels and having meetings. There's and, and all you have to do, and like these guys maybe didn't go to college for it, you know, um, they just had a taste and a knowledge of music that you acquired through DJing because DJing is not just sitting up there and playing records. It's about knowing music, understanding music, um, selecting music, selecting the right records. And that's pretty much what radio is, is selecting the records that you think people are going to want to hear. I had a great conversation with Bobby Boucher in Cleveland. He's one of the residents at Forward, and he's been playing all over the place, you know, Chicago, Florida, Kansas City. Like, And we had this exact conversation of like, Oh, I took a role doing this, entertainment director, and here's all the things that I've learned. It's it sucked. It takes a lot of my time, but it's made me such a better person in the industry because I've learned all these things. And he was saying the same thing, like, I used to never know how to do this, and now I know how to program the night. I know how to buy talent. I know how to do all this stuff. And it's, like, it's super valuable, and it, it's interesting. Like, we're going to have Bobby on the show for sure because he brings so much more to the table than just being a dope DJ or yeah. just being a dope producer, but he's doing all these other things and can have conversations and, and bring more, just bring more to the table than someone who's just a DJ, you know? A lot of like the, the skills that I like really am using right now in just like the academy and everything else, like I, I acquired over COVID really, right? Like, I don't know if you know this, but I never used Ableton. I haven't used Ableton a day in my life before COVID. And I learned Ableton 
through the academy, like by teaching other guys. I learned it just off the whim. So I learned Ableton. Another big thing that I had a lot, because I'm not a music guy. I'm not, I, I think I've talked about this on the podcast before, but I'm not a music like genius by any means. I, I, I hated music class. I barely even knew chords until I took it in music theory. But the more that I was writing songs, I didn't think I was a good songwriter ever. But the more that I wrote songs, I probably wrote, whether I co-wrote or wrote myself, probably close to 200 songs in the last three years. You know how good I got now at writing songs and it comes so naturally to me and I feel bad for some of my students. They're like, well, how did you come up with that so fast? And I'm like, it's I've been, done it every I've, day. I've written how many <laughs> songs, you know what I'm saying? And that was something that I wanted to improve on was learning new chord progressions and learning, um, you know, new things that could help me write songs better and faster. And, and I think that is another thing that you could have done. I think if you, if, if you didn't develop a skill in COVID, you're already so many light years behind because you had all the time in the world to do it. And now I'm sitting here, I can't even eat lunch, let alone think about learning another new skill, right? So learning the new skills are so, so important. And, and from a DJ's point of view, right? Like we're all DJs. I'm sure most of us listening are DJs here too. But like as you're adding these skills and you're learning more about the industry, when you're having conversations with high level people or decision makers or owners of venues or hospitality groups, when you could speak their language, they're going to have a lot more faith in booking you because they're Definitely. like, oh, Kareem gets it. He does all this other shit. He understands that he's just not going up there to play some songs, but he's going to bring the branding thing. He's going to promote the night. He's going to sell tickets or tables or whatever it takes to make sure that we have a good night, right? And, and that the, part of it is really valuable too that as you're bringing on these other skills and other parts of your, your business, it will help you as a DJ too. At the end of the day, this is a business, right? They don't call it the music fun place it's the music <laughs> business right like yeah it's fun like and a lot of djs they i think most djs probably get into it to you know play music meet girls drink get free drinks and all this stuff but it's a business right and i treat this as a business most times that's why when a lot of guys are like oh come out for a drink and come hang out while i dj well if i'm not getting paid man why am i going out to to go like you know what i'm saying like granted if it's a friend i'm gonna go but i always say now if i'm not getting paid i'm not going out right because this is a business. I could be doing other things to help my business, producing or doing this or tutoring somebody else to help my business. Why am I going to go out and have a couple drinks, right? So I'm always doing things to better my business. This is, you are the business. If you're an artist and you're a DJ and you want a manager, well, why is anybody going to come to your business? Why do you go to Starbucks, right? Because you like their coffee. Well, why are people going to see you? You are are the business and your product is the the music and the dj sets that you put out end of story i think we have our title for this episode i'm writing it down <laughs> <laughs> no but that's so good i mean like that's such guys like think about that and that's so important you got to really 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 think of that take that take that to heart because that just gave me goosebumps because it's so true like and not everybody thinks about it that way. And I think the people who are successful think about it in that way. They so. always think about it. Like everyone that I've I've ever, you know, ran into in music that's successful, artists, managers, agents, you know, they treat this as a business. They don't take their, their DJ money and they don't go and buy sneakers and, and spend it on a fancy car and all this stuff. Granted, if they have it, then yeah, go ahead and do that. But you know what they do? They reinvest it back into their business. And that's the music. For me... Right now, one of my main goals is building this studio with analog gear and all this shit, right? So my DJ gigs, I'm taking that money, I'm putting it away, and when the time comes, I pull the trigger on another piece of analog gear, or I'll pull the trigger on a plug-in. And that's what's important to me to grow my business because I know if I have the, that gear, I could A, make more money, B, charge more money, and do all of these other things, right? And as a DJ, it's hard. It's like where should you put your money into when you make a DJ gig, right? And I think the biggest thing for me, and this drives me crazy, is these DJs who are making three, $400 a night and have a logo that looks like a three-year-old did it. Don't you think one of these nights they would take $100 and hire somebody on Fiverr to get a professional logo, right? You don't need these Microsoft Office font logos. Invest in your brand. Have somebody on Fiverr that's an upcoming graphic designer 
get you a color scheme and a logo and this branding package. Like if you look at my EPK and everything, it's the logo, it's the fonts. They're all consistent with everything. And that is so freaking important. And it, it grinds my gears. It does. No, I love, I love that. It's perfect timing because we're at get down is actually having like an EPK day. We're great. We're, we're going to a studio. We're going to shoot everyone's headshots. I have a graphic designer who's going to cut all the headshots. So you have PNG files for flyers. We're going to go through all the things you should have in a Dropbox folder that when someone asks about booking you, you can send them the, the Dropbox folder. We're going to talk about digital EPKs. And we're going to talk about why this stuff is so important. And it is. It's that so That is important. the coolest thing I've ever heard. I, you know, we always talk about this, but what you guys do for, like, the younger guys – you never had that. I never had that. It was always like cutthroat and like you, you were afraid to almost ask DJs for advice because they would be like down your throat or like, oh, you're going to you're going to take my spot or you're going to take my residency. But what you guys do by hosting an EPK thing, that's that's just unreal. That's amazing. See, like, you know? but that's we're reinvesting in get down, right? Like that's on a higher level. We're reinvesting money that we make to make our DJs better and more presentable and more sellable to bookers. Right. To try to help them get out of market and, and play bigger shows and all that stuff. And guess who's going to grow business-wise? You're reinvesting in your business so that you can grow as a business's get-down. But a lot For of sure. guys just don't understand that. It's a, it's a conversation that needs to be had when it comes to DJing because everyone thinks that this is just a giant party when yeah. it's not a party. You know, I remember um, – I, I met somebody one time, uh, and, and he came up to me, and we were having a conversation. He was much, much older than me, um, and, you know, we were having an intellectual conversation, and he said to me, well, you know, what are you going to do when DJing doesn't work out? I go, it doesn't work out, and I, I said, you know I'm not just a DJ, right? Like, you know, I just don't DJ weddings. I produce music. I make my own music. I have a whole school that I have that with 100-plus students now, like – it's yeah, the, the title is DJ, but there's a business behind the DJ. My my LLC is Parari Music. It's not Parari I just DJ weddings, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. yeah, if I do a wedding maybe, I'll put that money into my business. If I it the business takes in money, and that's the thing that a lot of guys aren't understanding. And I had to, you know, explain that to this guy like, "Hey man, listen, like I do other things, whether it's, you know, I'm a DJ, but my business takes in money from royalties and it takes in money from this and that. And it's all of these things combined. Yeah, I, I love I love that advice. And I, for, for everyone listening, I think uh, like, like Parari just said, investing in your logo or your EPK or whatever it is. I, I think a couple things that you guys should think about investing your money is I, what I see people make mistakes. Number one, instead of making your own flyer or monthly calendar or whatever that looks okay or may not look okay, pay someone who's a professional to do it. It's 65 or 75 bucks or whatever it is. It's going to look amazing. Yeah. It's going to make your brand look better. The way I've been spending my money and reinvesting my money for DJ Cream, photographers, videographers, and someone to make me TikToks because I hate doing all those things, like especially making the TikToks, but I know how important it is for my brand to continue rolling down the mountain and continue booking these high level shows, I have to have that stuff. I have to present myself as top of the market, right? Like top of the class and being having these videos is suit and these photos and and showing people what I'm doing at these shows is the most important thing for me right now. And that's where I'm spending my money personally. If you're not good at something, pay somebody to do it. Simple Shout as that. Shout to Mikey so I didn't have to pay somebody in uh, Charleston for taking video for me. <laughs> that was all all free content, yeah. Um, but yeah, that was uh, you know that was that was that was a, my pleasure to do it. It was fun, and I knew how much it meant to you to have those videos. So you know, if it meant me not having a, another vodka and taking a couple videos, <laughs> you, you, you know, didn't need it. Was probably it when better I saw off. you. You definitely didn't need it. <laughs> I definitely did not need it. No, there was, was one point where I looked at your eyes were a little glazed over. I'm like, man, is Mikey like really getting it after it? Listen, out we here? had a pool party a couple hours before. <laughs> you know, your boy's thirty now. He can't drink. Well, he can still drink like he used to. The next day, recovery was a little bit, but. Uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a good time down in uh, good old Charleston. <laughs> so la last topic I want to get into, and this is something that hit home for, for us because it was in our backyard in New York City, but also a lot of our DJs were attendees at Electric Zoo in New York oh. City. And I, I want to pose the question, is EZU like Firefest 2.0? Was it that bad? I don't think it was that bad, but I think Izu has had some problems in the past. Um, if I remember the last couple of years, um, and I think that this was maybe the final blow. Um, 
I, I, I personally have never been to Izu. Um, and I don't know why. I just think because at the time when I was getting into music, we had e EDC New York, which was literally in Sea Caucus. Yeah. Um, we had Governor's Island, so I was going to shows there. And I was like, and, and Labor Day weekend was always a big weekend at the Jersey Shore, as you know, so like for DJing. It was like the last hurrah, so I was always working. But I've never been to Izu, so I can't comment on like the uh, like the production or whatever. But from what I saw, um, the stage wasn't built, and I don't know what the logistics of that was, but. I did see a couple things. I saw mid set there was like a blackout on like one of the two of the screens on the right hand side. Yeah. I saw that and I don't know if this is true. I saw somebody post that Pasqua Rotella flew in to help them, the the owner of Insomniac to go help them build stages. Um I don't know what was going on and and, and their statement they tried to blame like, you know, I don't want to say COVID, but supply chain. And I'm like, yeah. that's not really a thing anymore, is it? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I kind of, I have, so I have like the timeline, right? So we had, a, we had a couple DJs who were actually working on production and they were giving us like inside scoop as to what was going on. And on Thursday night, uh, they were like, I don't know if this is going to be done for tomorrow. Like main stage isn't even close to being done. And then, you know, Friday, they worked through the night and weren't able to, to get the main stage up and running. But uh, so Friday they canceled because they failed to complete construction of the main stage. Mm -hmm. Saturday they had a bunch of sound cut out, video board cut out during Tiesto, video board cut out during uh, Dom Dalla and John Summit. Uh, there was four to five hour waits to go from Will Call to actually getting into this, the place. Wow. So you get there at 4 o'clock, you don't get in until 9 o'clock, and the show ends at 11. Yeah. And then Jeez. Sunday... They oversold the show, and it, they were over capacity, and they were trying to tell people that they, you know, they weren't letting anyone else in, and like one to two thousand people stormed the gates to go in there. Yeah, that was crazy. I saw that on TikTok and stuff, but that always happens at like a lot of festivals. There was a couple. I don't know if it was Ultra or somewhere else, but I've seen that happen a lot of times. Like these fans don't care; they're just storming, and once you get a stampede, like you know, one or two guys isn't going to stop that. But yeah, it it logistically, it's it's a it's a it's a knife in the heart for New York because I feel like New York at one point was the mecca of dance music. Um, you know, back when I was, you know, kind of coming up, like to the early 2000s or whatever, it really, really was. You had Pasha, Governor's Island, like people would travel far and wide, EDC New York, and and then you had Izu. And then like now we're trying to grow New York back to this, you know, dance music staple, and then you get stabbed in the heart like this, you know, so – I don't yeah, know where the future lies for Izu. Um, I'm hoping that it could still happen, but now I see that the mayor is trying to punish them and and all this stuff. So it could be it could end in a nightmare. Yeah. So it's new ownership and new management of the festival. Uh, the people who own Avant Gardner and Brooklyn Mirage in Brooklyn now own Izu. So I think which was previously made event. Correct. Yes. Okay. Previously made event. So. I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I was someone who was going to Izu every year. Yes, I was DJing, but I'd always try to sneak in like, all right, I'm going to go to Izu from early, and I'll leave early so I could get to my set at 11 o'clock at night or whatever and leave the festival grounds early. And a lot of my core memories of going to festivals and, and seeing EDM and really falling in love with EDM trace back to Izu. So it hurts my heart. I haven't been there in a few years because – you know, we're busy and working, and I'm older, and I can't really go do the festival thing for 12 hours, nor do I really want to. Like, where Electric Zoo is set up, it's on an island. You have to take a ferry, or it's a pain to get there, you know? Like, it's a it's pain, annoying. yeah. Yeah. Um, but a lot of our guys, a lot of our DJs were there this weekend, and, you know, they said once they were in there and were watching the shows, like, the music was great, and it was great to be a part of it. But, you know, a lot of the feedback was understaffed, not enough security, not enough medical uh, and it, I saw you know, water, like some guy was like well. trying to get water. He couldn't get water in any of the fountains. It's like those are the things that festivals need to hit on the head if they don't want to go down. And I just think it was a – they just weren't prepared. I don't think they yeah. were prepared well enough. I mean you look at like – festivals like ultra right and they're constantly constantly battling with the city of miami about all these things but they're getting the permits the stages are building seven or eight stages maybe even more and the stages are getting done the production is on point right and i think that this one was just rushed i don't know if they just were like understaffed and they couldn't find people or if like they just 
just had logistical nightmares throughout yeah. everything, but maybe they hired the wrong people. But it, it, it that it's not looking good for them, unfortunately. And uh, you know, you have all the other stuff surrounding Avant Gardner as well, with like the the people missing that are going missing from there. Yep. So you know, there's there's just a lot of logistical nightmares going on. And and again, I have friends that you know work at the Avant Gardner, and it's like I said, it's a pain to the heart. It, it it's, yeah. it's it sucks because you want New York to be this this mecca of music, and I really hope that you know they could find a way to make everything work out and that the mayor doesn't lay like the band hammer on them and uh and you know do something yeah i mean they're getting greedy right they're overselling the venue they're overselling brooklyn mirage they're overselling ezu and once you start making things unsafe for people that's when the cities are going to step in and start to 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 nix things so that's where i worry about you know not only ezu and the future of ezu but also the future of brooklyn mirage and what they're doing there because they really are bringing in the best talent in the world there and again, we haven't had another one where I haven't been to. I haven't been to the Brooklyn Mirage. And shout out to Jermaine. He keeps inviting me every time I see him. And I just, I say, hey, man, I'm just busy. I, I don't have time, you know. And I got Zach Martino invited me out with him the other day to Brooklyn Mirage. Um, yeah, Zach it's just that Steve it's, it's Angelo, a pain. Which is fire. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a. It's a pain to get to. And 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 I, for me to make the trip all the way over there, it's like, oh, it's like going to Yankee game, right? Like I love the Yankees, but it's like. <laughs> Do I really want to make the trip all the way over to you know Queens and then and go to Yankee Stadium and it's like whoa, whoa, yeah whoa. you do the Bronx the Bronx sorry the Bronx the Bronx sorry but like you know going over the bridge and going through you know that that whole borough it's like it's such a pain in the ass and it's like it's the same thing with like Brooklyn Mirage and and I really do want to check these venues out and now I'm like hoping that nothing really happens with them because um you know I still I still want to go I want to experience it and what they're doing. Like talent wise, I mean, every I've known people that I don't even know if they've even listened to dance music in their life were at the Brooklyn Mirage, you know, at one point. It's just a really, really awesome, awesome venue. And uh, I'm praying, I'm praying for a miracle here. It doesn't look, it doesn't look that good. Hopefully, this mayor doesn't lay the, uh, the hammer on him, like I said. Yeah. We'll see. Uh, all right. I think this is a good point to wrap. Let's, uh, let's, let's promote Pro Parai Production Academy. What do you, what do you got going on? What do you, what, how can people work with you? What's, yeah, deal? I'm I'm actually really excited about the academy right now. Um, I'm I'm making plans right now to open up the Discord for everybody, and I actually just launched subscriptions. Uh, so if you do want to be able to work with me, there are server subscriptions now. So there's tier one, tier two, tier three. The higher tier you go, the more access you get to my schedule, which is awesome, and you also get other goodies. I've been doing a lot of uh, exclusive videos, plug-in giveaways, um, a lot of cool things to to grow the community, but. Uh, we also have two courses that we just uh, finished. We have the beginner course and the house music course. Both of those are on sale. If you guys missed them, you could always hit me up, and I could uh, get you started with those courses. And, um, yeah, things are moving, man. I'm, uh, I'm really happy with the way the Academy is going. I'm always looking to improve it, um, and it's, it's been great. So you guys can follow it at Perari Production Academy or, or, sorry, at Perari Prod Academy on Instagram. Um, and look out for a lot of new TikTok content that's coming with that coming in the fall. I'm really excited to launch that. Nice. Yeah, man. Without without Priority Production Academy and Mikey, my original music would not be out. So Mikey's awesome. Not only I say this every time, not only is he a great producer, but he's a great teacher and coach. And that's the hard part of this, right? There's a lot of people that are really knowledgeable about producing music, but Mikey's really good at teaching and helping you understand certain things and certain uh, certain aspects of producing music. So if, if you haven't worked with Mikey and you want to get into production, this is the best way to do it. Yeah, thank oh. you. Appreciate that. Uh, the only other thing I will promote, we have Beats, Bartenders, and Brushes for anybody local, Tri-State New York City, Get Down Party, uh, next Wednesday, September 13th. It's in Hoboken, New Jersey. You can go to Get Down DJ Group on IG to check out more details. But uh, we're going to be doing open decks. So if you're interested in signing up for the open decks, showing us what you got, I mean, I, I, love, I love it. I was so, so inspired by the DJ sets I heard at the first one that I'm excited to hear whoever plays this time around. If you are a DJ trying to get involved with Get Down DJs <laughs> and you're not at this trying to get on the decks and show what you got, then I don't want to hear it. End of, end of story. <laughs> I'm glad you said it and not me. <laughs> yeah, guys, like this is the easiest way. People ask me every day, every time, how do we work with you guys? You know what the best way to work with us is? Come DJ for 30 minutes and show me that you're a good show DJ. Show me what and, you got. And, and you're dope. <laughs> Show me what you got.
So and come prepared. Don't come and 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 blow it. <laughs> You know, come, come with your edits, your exclusive stuff. Prepare for this like you would prepare for a festival, and show us what you got. It's funny you're saying that because we're, I think me and Gary are gonna do a set at like the October one, and I already started preparing my set because I'm like, shit, I gotta DJ in front of all these DJs. I gotta bring something yeah, it's gotta like. Gotta be good. Unique. You gotta put your it's routines together. Yep, yeah, I, I get it. My, I gotta get my routines going. Some new yep. stuff, maybe some tone plays. I'll yep. pull out like the old, the old like cream hip hop DJ stuff maybe for that set. Definitely. <laughs> so. All right, guys. Thanks for listening to this episode. Talk to you guys soon. Peace. Peace.